Welcome to today's webinar compiled and produced by the team at biznews.com. All of our webinars are interactive. We encourage you to pose questions to our guests. The more challenging, the better. And the earlier you get the questions in, the better the chance of having them answered. The recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. Indeed it shall, and uh, the man who's going to make sure that it is, is uh, Stuart Lohman, my colleague, our general manager here at BizNews. Uh, come on, Stu, let's, uh, let's put our, there we go, we've got our pictures on. You can see we are not cardboard cutouts, we in fact are here in our uh, studio in Santon, we work. What time is the, is the recording up? Hopefully in the next hour or two, I like if Depends on internet strength, as always. Okay, depends on internet strength, but our internet <laughs> strength here is pretty, pretty good. good yeah. uh, so, if you happen to leave us sometime in the next hour, you will be able to watch the full recording a little bit later on. But, uh, Stu, you want to just take us through the tech? Yes, thanks, Alec. Um, if you can see Alec myself on the screen, and there's also a nice presentation for, which shows great growth, as always, Alec, with this portfolio. Um, if you can see that, and you can hear my voice loud and clear, Please just give us a high five. There's a little high five button on the control panel on the right hand side there. Let me just check. I've got a few. Ah, there we go, Alec. Always good to see those high fives. Mm, looks I know like we, we're not allowed to do them really anymore, are we? The high fives with COVID. But we'll give elbows, eh? Have you been watching uh, that uh, Emily in Paris? Anyway, no. you know, they've got high fives they do there, <laughs> a very rude thing. No, I'm not no. going there. And my wife watches it and I haven't joined her in that. Show. Netflix, that's the reason why there is context for this because we're talking Netflix a little bit later. Exactly. And as we do like to keep And your it. wife only, anyway, in <laughs> other words, you think I'm a girl. Hmm. It's not only girls who like these sensitive movies, I must tell you. Apparently it's good for social media insight. I like that's what Precisely, really that's, that's exactly why I watch it, yeah. Nothing to do with the girls. <laughs> um, we, just on, before we get going, Alec, there's a little questions bar on the control pin as well. Please put the questions in as soon as possible. We don't like to miss out as we do. The time does fly with this, port, uh, this discussion. So please get them in nice and early and I'll pause once Alec as we run through. I see there are quite a few already. So yeah. Stu's right. Um, please do tap in those questions as soon as you can. We've got a big, a big crew, a big crowd today. Not surprisingly, when you have a look at that portfolio. So I'm going to put my camera off. Uh, and just take you through the presentation. And then I guess as we go through, we can pick up on questions. The compound annual growth rate of 22.2% in US dollars is pretty good. Uh, it does, however, reflect that we've had everything going in our favor for the past nearly six years now. And when you consider that Warren Buffett in his portfolio has done 20% over more than 50 years, it shows you how good he is because we've really had everything going in our favor. Uh, in this past month, the uh, returns actually went up a little bit in, in US dollar terms. And the reason for that is that the RAND strengthened. Uh, so let's just get into the, the whole story. I think uh, this, I did put this uh, slide or a slide like this up last month, and it really is reflective because August uh, was a, a surging um, time for this portfolio and in fact for US markets generally. Then they started coming back again. And as you can see in October, in RAND terms, we were up nearly 2%, but in dollars by 6%. So it just gives you an underlying understanding that the RAND was particularly strong during this past month. And uh, we've had two highlights in our portfolio. Uh, the one, well, a low light in Wilson Bailey, which went down 6%. I was very surprised about that because we had the announcement from the president about the fact that South Africa is going on a infrastructure drive. That's President Sora Ramaphosa here in South Africa and uh, in Wilson Bailey, which is the last major construction company that's left, actually went backwards 
after that news. So it seems as though the skepticism, or should I rather put it as cynicism, about South Africa's government's ability to execute seems to be at a all time well, all time high, the cynicism, all time low, the confidence. But who knows? Maybe uh, our Wilson Bailey will come back. At some point in time, South Africa has to get into its construction site mode. And when it does, then there can be no doubt that the best position company in the country and on the JSC is Wilson Bailey. And then you can see right at the bottom there, Cloudflare, which had a 40% surge in the past month. I'm going to talk a bit more about that. A good move by Spotify again. That's more to do with Spotify actually being oversold uh, rather than bouncing back aggressively. But it's, it's a good month for the portfolio. And when you get your biggest stock, Amazon, putting on 8%, uh, and your biggest local stock, NASPERS, also getting 8%. Well, it isn't a surprise to see that the shares in the portfolio have uh, risen quite nicely in the month as a whole. The RAND also played its part. It is not a one-way bet. Although you, when you listen to many commentators, they would tell you or suggest to you that the RAND is going to weaken indefinitely. As you can see in the past month, we went from 1680, 16 Rand 80 to about one US dollar to around 17.20, and at the moment, it's a rand stronger, one whole rand stronger. It's below 16 rand 20 to the US dollar. What does that mean? Well, if you've got extra rands and you want to invest it in the web trader portfolio, now is the time to do so. And remember, you can invest in this portfolio up to a million rand, no questions asked by the Reserve Bank. That's because we have a one million rand a year offshore allowance. Uh, in our exchange control uh, country. For most people, that's more than sufficient. Here's the portfolio. It uh, just gives you a breakdown of uh, how dominant Amazon is in our portfolio and how amazing it has performed, amazingly it has performed. 25% um, of the portfolio today, and as I say, if that picks up 8% in one month, then you know that uh, you've had a good month. But looking through the rest of them, Apple is our second biggest stock and as it just happens, the second best performer. Then comes Microsoft, which is a surprise to see how well that support as uh, Microsoft has performed. Um, and then you go down to the next best performer is Cloudflare. And uh, there's a big story there. And most of that performance came indeed in the past month, although we did buy in in March, the first of uh, three installments, um, at about $17. And it's now sitting at, as you can see, $55 a share. So we've uh, we, we got into that one at the right time, got into Spotify at the right time. And it, what is most gratifying for me is the returns that we've seen from many of the stocks that we bought this year uh, in Discovery is up nearly 100% in US dollar terms, 83% in RAND terms. We bought that at the bottom of the market in March. Uh, Spotify, which we also bought in March, um, but Spotify and Cloudflare, given the way that we structure this portfolio, we buy it over three uh, periods. But holding your head during the pandemic has really paid off well. The portfolio as a whole is up 55% uh, since the worst of times at, uh, of the pandemic when it got to 6.8 million rand, now sitting as you can see at 10.6 million rand. Compound annual growth rate, that's the more important thing. Although the portfolio has gone from 2.2 million rands as a starting point uh, when we began on the 5th of December, and it's now sitting at 10.5 million rand, that translates in compound annual growth rates of 30%. So it just shows you if you can grow your portfolio by these kind of rates, 20 to 30% uh, per annum, and you do it consistently, you're getting growth on growth, and uh, that gives you a, an, a phenomenal return in the underlying value of your money. Of course, it's the contrary thing as well. If you lose, uh, if you keep losing money by trading too much or buying the wrong stocks or uh, just not, not not thinking sensibly before you buy, but buying high and and, uh, and selling low, uh, panicking when everybody else is panicking, as happened in March this year, well, then that wipes out your capital pretty quickly. So the, the secret to this is that we have literally made just over half a dozen sales in the whole period. In That's uh, coming up for six years on the 5th of December. And it's because before we buy the shares in this portfolio, we really, really look at them study them well, know the company well, and then hold. And sometimes you get an Amazon. Uh, sometimes you don't get an Amazon. We had a, a Metro Bank, but when that changed, when the views changed there, 
uh, when the scandal came out and the cockroaches started emerging from that kitchen, we knew there wasn't just one cockroach and we got out at 30 pounds a share today. It's 61p, 98% decline. So it just shows, if you haven't done that all the time, we made a, a big mess um, of selling Tesla. Uh, that's gone up 700% since we sold, but sometimes it's better just to avoid your losses. Moving on to uh, the individual stock performances there, you can see, um, I won't dwell on this for too long, but what is uh, exciting is that we now have five companies in the portfolio that have risen by more than 100% in South African rands. And uh, of those best performers, obviously Cloudflare, which we only just added in this year. Netflix has done well for us as well, 99%, and Discovery and Spotify also very, very good performers. Down the bottom of the pack, I, I get uh, my neighbor, Manny, keeps revving me up about we were uh, about not we work about slack i still think that slack is a fabulous company uh, we use it here in biz news and they are well capitalized they're well positioned it is a phenomenal operation for the future uh, then to you which is the worst performer in the portfolio at the moment i'm i'm not bothered at all in fact i'd be buying more to you shares especially after the interview that I had with Rob Paddock. Um, and just by way of context, Rob and his brother started a company in Cape Town called Get Smarter. Uh, what Get Smarter was, is, or is rather, is a remote learning uh, operation that's, that helps people all over the world, not just in South Africa, to get degrees from the top universities in the world. So, and it's not, it's not like, uh, what our kids are doing with their Zoom learning, they're sent home by the teachers and then they have these Zoom lectures uh, occasionally. Um, people, some of it does stick, but for a lot of the time, it, it really isn't custom purpose or purpose made. Whereas what Get Smarter did was they started online, a little bit like Biz News, which started online, didn't come from a newspaper. Anyway, uh, when I was interviewing Rob about the new uh, project that he has, uh, by the way, they sold Get Smarter to 2U for 1.8 billion rand. So it was a, a huge success story. When I was talking to him this in the last week, actually, about Valencia Institute, which is one of our business partners, we're quite excited about uh, the, the work that they're doing. Where Rob is now, he can't go in the, obviously into the university field, so he's gone into high schools in South Africa. And it's a, a phenomenal opportunity. They're taking all these learnings from the universities and they're plugging it in to help people working or, or children who work at home and they have campuses it's it's really it's a go and go and read and go and listen to that interview um, on biz news about valencia institute anyway they're up they're our partner there and i asked him in the discussion what about to you he says it's a phenomenal company i said oh, we put it in the portfolio is it good for you <laughs> so it might be down by eight percent but uh, with Iran putting on a bit of strength mm, and the share price down a little in US dollar terms, uh, I'm taking the obvious hint. There's the portfolio performance, uh, a bit disappointing at the moment to you and Wilson Bailey in the negative, but you, you can never really time your purchases correctly. I remember, uh, well, both Amazon and Apple uh, went down uh, before they went up for us. But you can see how you don't have to be too clever if you if you bought amazon it's 327 dollars uh, to actually look like you really know what you're doing when you're investing in in stocks <laughs> okay let me talk quickly about cloudflare you can see that surge in the share price in the last month uh, up uh, very very dramatically it was trading as you can see around about 30 odd uh, 35 dollars it peaked above 60 dollars reason for this is Cloudflare, for those of you who've been in these portfolio uh, updates uh, over some period and will remember in March when we started buying them at $17, you can see we got it right there at the bottom, below $20 a share. So very fortunate uh, timing of that first purchase. What we do, incidentally, just to recap, is that when we buy American shares or shares that are listed outside of South Africa, they are done in three tranches. 
the first tranche uh, on in, in the month that we announced it, the second tranche a month later, the third tranche a month thereafter. So you can see that in the three months since we bought our first tranche, uh, the Cloudflare share price went from $17 to well in the mid-20s when we finished off. So our average price is $24 a share. The reason for that is that you want to take the RAND out of it. So the RAND, for instance, as we saw this month, has gone from 1680 to 1620. So if you were buying the shares this month, you'd be getting a whole lot more dollars for your RANDs than you would have a month ago. So you want to just get the RAND volatility out of it. Anyway, getting back to Cloudflare itself, it's been a, a, a really good performer for us. It's an internet security business. And what happened in the last month was that they launched Cloudflare One, which is their new product that actually addresses this massive move of people from working in an office environment to working from anywhere, from home, from coffee shops, uh, and on various devices, their, their, uh, their home computers, their laptops, uh, their, their phones, or uh, their, their iPads. Now, if you think about it, if you're in the internet security business, or um, your your IT guys at the office. The whole thing has been built over many years on what the way what Cloudflare describes as a castle and moat approach. So everyone comes into the office. You use the computers in the office. You've got a moat around a security moat around your technology in the office. Nobody can get in. Uh, but by the same token, when you go out, it's very difficult. And that's what's happened. So Cloudflare one addresses that issue it enables people who work for corporates anywhere in the world to be able to log in through and to be log in securely it's it's a phenomenal product and it has so uh, it's the reason for that surge in the share price come down a little bit in the, which is not surprising because it's always a question of people overreacting when they see something highly innovative but it is the kind of stock that you can be happily accumulating that's the reason for cloudflare's uh, surge in the past month let to talk very briefly about netflix and here i took a year's graph uh, as you can see a year ago netflix was under 300 dollars a share uh, before the quarterly results came out it was trading at 550 so there was a lot of anticipation of the quarterly results that was a little stupid because netflix had told us that it had a phenomenal first six months of the year due to COVID. In the first six months of the year, Netflix added 26 million new paying subscribers. Now the whole of 2019, they added 27 million. So at some point in time, you just can't keep expanding. There aren't, there aren't that many customers. So you can't keep growing it at that rate. And they did warn three months previously that this was an exceptional bump and not to expect that it's going to continue. But of course, Mr. Market doesn't listen to that. And Mr. Market was very disappointed when Netflix came out with only 2.2 million increase in subscribers for the third quarter, uh, coming off a much higher base and coming off a, a real surge during the COVID time. The Netflix guys said, look, we did tell you this was the situation. We did e expect that there would be a slowdown in the uh, in the third quarter uh, to the end of September. But we would remind you that for the year as a whole, so far, the first nine months, we have added, Netflix has added new subscribers of 28 million. And last year, the whole of last year was 27 million. So you still got a full quarter to go. And uh, Netflix expects that uh, there's going to be quite good numbers for the next uh, three months. But the share price, as you can see, has come down to around 480, and it's in a lovely band there, which means you can now get back in if you don't own Netflix shares yet. It looks like a very good time to purchase. This is what was making the uh, investors or the traders rather than investors a little bit nervous. The revenue growth, the quarterly revenue growth at Netflix has been declining, but it's still above 20%. Uh, by the way, that quarter four is estimated. Uh, and usually they tend to be fairly accurate on their estimates going forward. It's year on year growth. And if you get over 20% a year, it becomes exponential, as you saw from the way that our portfolio in six years has grown from 2 million Rand, 2.2 million Rand to 10 million Rand. That's a 30% uh, 
uh, revenue growth. If you're at 20%, you you still double very uh, in in a very short period of time. So Netflix is looking at a 20% a, a growth in their revenue. It's still very much an exponential company. It's still expanding dramatically internationally and producing amazing shows like Emily in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the uh, that's the main story. Just to keep us keep us humble, uh, here are the stocks that we have sold over the period. Uh, we've actually now sold one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten stocks. Uh, this is over the last six years. Sassel was one of our um, best uh, options in the South African market. When we buy shares here, we buy them all at once. On the 24th of March, you can see we bought. 27 at 27 rand. Uh, we then had one of the rational radio uh, discussions uh, in June. Obviously, you can see 22nd of June we sold in, in that month's portfolio, at which our commentators were warning us that the Sassel share price had been pushed higher by day traders using the Robin Hood app in the United States. That combined with the fact that we'd had an incredible surge in the share price since we bought it, uh, enabled us to take profits. We don't do that often. I mean, we very, very rarely do that. The only time that the shares would be sold is on the basis of something fundamentally different happening in the, in the market. And uh, that has proved to be, so we were in low, out high, uh, Sassel's just uh, my favorite share in the whole world, um, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, and yes, um, yesterday, we had the CEO of Sassel, who actually celebrates one week in his new job, um, Fleetwood Hrobler, in our studio. I didn't ask him, Stu, where Fleetwood comes from. I don't, I'm, not, I'm, sure, not, I'm sure it's not Fleetwood Mac, though, Ellie. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is Stuart. I tell you, he started singing Fleetwood and whistling Fleetwood Mac uh, songs uh, just can't help ourselves when we get that name in. But what a what a, uh, a really really sussed guy, very humble. Uh, he's an engineer because he's got fantastic control over what's going on at the business. And clearly, for the longer term, Sassel is going to reward its shareholders. You almost feel that way. He's he's talking about at one point in time. Uh, building back to to uh, a good market cap, but anyway, Sassel's in good hands at the moment, and around 100 rand a share, given all the risks, given where it is right now, given the oil price, given the chemicals price, and the the recent deal that they did in the United States, halving off half of that disastrous Lake Charles uh, adventure, 100 rand does seem to be pretty useful, a, a pretty reasonable price. From our perspective, though, our investments always in this portfolio have been in human ingenuity. And Sassel is completely dependent on the Rand oil price. So it was it just it was just ridiculous at 27 Rand a share. That's why we bought into it. Uh, but it's unlikely that in this portfolio we'll be buying Sassel shares again. I say to stay humble because have a look at Tesla. Uh, I was worried about the way that Tesla's uh, chief executive Elon Musk was behaving himself at the time, maybe got a little bit sucked into all the drama and uh, said, you know, we've made, a, we've made a little bit of profit on Tesla. We don't know where this thing is going, bankrupt or, or to the skies. I want to sleep nicely at night and then we sold. And uh, as you can see from that position, Tesla has put on 733%. So I love looking at this because it really reminds me that sometimes uh, you do get it right, but in in for the most part, uh, it's only when the cockroaches are coming out of the kitchen that it is time to sell. Okay, Stu, so there's our uh, presentation for today. I'll leave the portfolio up there because I'm sure there are going to be more questions on it. Thanks. I know David Shapiro, just on Sassel, he target price 70 to 80 rand. He mentioned yesterday in the webinar, but that's just... No, that's a very good, that's actually a very good point. And it's all, the webinar's up. It's... Yeah, I've just put the link up on okay. the chat as well here. Yeah, so if you, want, if you want to go and uh, listen to it, it was really good. Pit Villun was quite, quite uh, abrasive uh, at times, but that's Pit. Uh, he certainly um, calls a spade a bloody shovel um, and very focused in his discussions. And I thought that uh, Fleetwood Hrobler came came back very well, answered it particularly well. But David's point that uh, Stu just reminded us on is a good one. 
he says he'll be looking around 70 to 80 rand a share he'll be buying into sasol again thanks Alec. Um, i suppose with, just on the questions with the election next week it's coming through quite prominently um just questions around biden and what do you think him winning would do for the markets and would it negatively impact the tech stocks we've got a partnership with the wall street journal as you guys know and by the way uh we've now sorted out our technical issues we, I'm, i think i need to send that email to everyone just to say yep. uh, do you remember what the what the main thing on the password is yeah i'm just on the passwords with the, we obviously want to be in line with the wall street journal so they've got a, a, a limit of five to 15 characters and only numbers and letters so no special characters like ats and hashtags and stuff because then you can have the same password across premium and wall street journal so it's seamless rather than and that confused us because we didn't know that before it was only after we took some deep diving to find out why so many of our premium subscribers were not accessing wall street journal and then writing to us and we couldn't really work it out but eventually Stu um spent a lot of time with our external software consult uh, tech consultant and they've got to the bottom of it so basically when you have your password on biz news which we allow you to use anything you could put abc if you wanted as your password now what we're going to suggest is that you align that with the wall street journal only use letters and numbers not exclamation marks at uh, all of those ampersands uh, and then you can use the same password on biz news that you can use on the wall street journal the only criteria is that once a month you've got to log into the wall street journal via the biz news premium section then you you a for away anyway i've been reading a lot of the Wall Street Journal I, I, with my morning newsletter. I scan the whole paper. I don't read it all. I think that you'd have to be Superman to do that. But I've been following this election very carefully. And it is, it is so interesting that although there's a lot of aggravation on both sides, and, and sometimes, you know, we got problems in South Africa. But when I look at the issues that they're dealing with in the United States, you sometimes feel quite relieved that we don't have to go through the the, uh, the the incredible uh, um, dysfunctional society that that it appears to be in in so many respects over there. Anyway, uh, let's not get onto onto comparisons because it depends where you live in the world. But time and again, reading on the investment side, all these top top guys are telling us it really doesn't matter who wins the election. If Trump wins, it's going to help. A little grouping of stocks, which would be on the energy side, it would it would help uh, Exxon Mobil and and maybe coal shares. And he's a little little less aggressive when it comes to renewable energy, whereas Biden is far more um, aggressive on that side. Biden has been painted as a communist and as a socialist by the Republicans. Trump has been uh, painted as a as an idiot and a, uh, a narcissistic uh, autocrat by the Democrats. The truth is they're much closer to each other than you'd ever imagine. And uh, we'll, as far as the, what they can do in society is concerned, Biden is almost certainly going to take a, a much softer line towards China. And that could get the trade war uh, that, that is that has broken out between the United States and uh, China due to Trump's interventions. It could calm that down and longer term, that could be better. But in the short term, apart from the energy sector, which is gonna be an obvious beneficiary uh, or part of it, a beneficiary from Biden and uh, um, other parts a beneficiary from Trump, uh, there really isn't gonna be that much difference. And I, I say that with some conviction, because although the big tech companies are, under fire from both sides of the house in other words both republicans and democrats what tends to happen if you look through history when the politicians start intervening and interfering in a sector is actually the incumbents win and what they're suggesting must happen is that apple microsoft amazon uh, perhaps even netflix certainly facebook and google should no longer be allowed to buy their way their way to growth so they should be only by only in reinvesting internally of course that's not going to please a lot of uh, innovators who are bringing up new companies and they look to those big majors to buy them out but that's 
That's the theory. That's that's what actually the politicians are trying to suggest. But if they do that, what do they do to the incumbents? They give them cash that they got to spend somewhere, and they're likely to spend that on things like share buybacks and dividends. So counterintuitively, if the if that ruling does come through, and that's kind of the only one that that seems possible in the antitrust area, if that were to come through, then it might even give the share prices uh, a, a little bit of a fillip. So all round, and uh, by the way, the one more likely to do that, of course, is Joe Biden, because the uh, the attacks on big tech at this point have been driven, although both sides of the house are happy with it or want it, um, it's much more aggressively from the Democrats. So American politics, we're now all becoming experts in it. We know by no means, in, I'm certainly by no means an expert, but from the stuff that I've read, at our partners who are experts, the Wall Street Journal, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident that, or comfortable that we won't be doing anything dramatic to our portfolio, whoever wins. Just on that, I've got, I was listening on the radio this morning and I was saying, it's interesting how people don't really take notice of the US politics, but the fact that when they sneeze and everyone catches a cold, you should have an idea of at least what could happen next year and have the update on stuff. 20, 26% of global GDP. Yeah. You know, it's still, it's like a quarter of, and we 0.5 here in South Africa. So I think the last time I did the analysis, we'd be, our contributions is about the same as a state like Maryland. You can put us in our place. Uh, there's a question from Jan Alec. I'm not sure how we answered this. Is it worth holding on to my investment in Anglo-American? Not that we've held it before. But... Jan, I can't, I'm sorry. It's outside my circle of competence. What I... What I can say to you is uh, the chief executive of Anglo-American is an incredibly competent man. Uh, Mark Kudifani, you, you, you've given your, your money or entrusted your funds to uh, one of the best managers, uh, certainly in that sector on the planet. So he's going to be doing everything possible to look after your investment. We don't in this portfolio buy into companies that are dependent on inanimate objects. To us, the whole idea is, like Warren Buffett, we like to invest in human ingenuity. And Anglo can, can do, they can be the most ingenious people on earth. The problem is their share price and their profits are going to be completely determined by commodity prices. And commodity prices, commodities are inanimate objects. And to actually call commodity uh, cycles, you really need to be a lucky and be a genius. And I'm um, well, okay, I hope I'm lucky, but I certainly uh, wouldn't qualify on the second point. So let's stay away from that. Let's rather do what Warren Buffett tells us. And he says that in investing, you don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be that clever. You've just got to retain control of your emotions. And that's really why this portfolio has done so well, because we haven't panicked. Thanks, Alec. Um, Andrew just wants to know, any chance of Process Naspers selling their stakes in Tencent? Um, I, I mean, who knows? Uh, but it's, it's certainly not what they've put on the agenda. Naspers has been an accumulator of assets in focused areas. And for the Nas, for, for Bob van Dijk to offload the Tencent shares would be a massive change in their strategy. Uh, I'll, just, I'll tell you a little story on this one because it's, it's, it's quite instructive. What is now Arena Holdings, which used to be TISO, which used to be Times Media, used to own 25% of multi-choice, well, Mnet as it, as it then was listed. And that 25% generated for the company 80 million rand a year in dividends. I remember it well because they would get more cash from their, their passive stake that they owned in multi-choice than they would make, much more than they would make in the business. And we were competing with them. Uh, this is when I was at MoneyWeb. And it used to irritate me to all the hell that these guys were making stupid decisions all the time, but they could afford it because they were getting this wonderful cash flow that came in. When they sold or unbundled, they didn't even sell it, they unbundled that to shareholders, the company just started going downwards. It went on a slippery slope. And you can almost, if you go back and have a look at that business from 
a, a really strong uh, organization which made a lot of mistakes but they were affordable mistakes to an organization that made a lot of mistakes which were unaffordable and events had eventually had to be sold uh, to our partners here at business who've uh, who've uh, uh Lebeche, who've actually bought 100 percent now of the of what used to be uh, Times Media and Tiso. It's a it, you can trace it all the way back to the unbundling. And I can tell you that Kurs Becker understands business history as well as anybody on the planet. And he will know that as long as he's got his 10 cent shares or 31% uh, stake that they own in 10 cent, he's set fair for the future as is Nasperis and as is process. So it would be a huge surprise to me to see them offloading their 10 cent share, apart from the fact that when they did sell, if you recall, it was about $400 a, a, a 10 cent share, and I think they're around $300 now. Um, they sold a couple of percentage points, so it went from 33 down to 31%, and uh, they banked $10 billion in cash as a result of that. Uh, the decision there was part of, or their promise there was that it would be for some years they wouldn't sell any more shares. So even if they wanted to sell shares today, they've got a couple of years still before they can do so. Thanks, Alan. Um, Johan's got a question around COVID and sort of this re-emergence of lockdown discussions in Europe. He wants to know if you think the infections rise in Europe and potentially the US, what it'll have on the markets, your expectations? I wrote a piece in the newsletter yesterday, in the Rational, Rational Perspective newsletter uh, yesterday, where I took the graphs of infections versus mortalities. And I'm sorry, I can't actually show you that right now, but the infections are much, much higher than they were uh, during the hysteria. The mortalities, though, are about a tenth of that level. So either what's happening is that they're doing a heck of a lot more testing and as a result finding more people with COVID-19 infections or we've become spectacularly better at making sure that people don't die of COVID-19. So I, I don't know, I'm on the, the Great Barrington Declaration uh, side and when I read, again that was in, in the, there was an interview with the two co-founders of that, um, yesterday in our newsletter from the Wall Street Journal, when I read that, I can, I, I, it doesn't stop making me realize that to go back into lockdowns is really a political aim. Uh, it's driven not by uh, logic, but driven by other, um, other views. Uh, if the mortalities were correlated directly to the increases in the infections, then for sure uh, you'd, you'd have a lot to worry about. But eventually cool heads do, uh, do, do rule. And in this case, it does appear as though, on top of which the whole Swedish experiment or the Swedish approach is showing us that COVID-19 um, hysteria is really just that. Thanks, Ed. I've just posted Nick Hudson's piece he wrote yesterday on the bogus COVID narrative, if anyone wants more insight on that side. Um, just, sorry, i got another one here. Uh, which listed companies could benefit from the infrastructure recovery plan? That's from EJ, uh, locally, obviously. Uh, EJ, I, uh, when we added Wilson Bailey to our portfolio in July, it was on the anticipation of the announcement that uh, President Ramaphosa made uh, earlier this month. And I looked at three stocks, and of course I took the one that went down, but the other two were Afrimat and Italta, and both of those have done very well. So you win some, you lose some, but uh, on a market cap valuation, Wilson Bailey just, just seemed so much cheaper than the other two, and I think in the long term it probably is. So it's definitely a play for uh, the, the construction boom. But I, I would refer you to Afrimat. It's a phenomenal business and one that is, uh, that is in the materials handling and iron ore. They really, this is just a very, very well managed business from a, uh, although it is a commodity based business, it's, it's got excellent management and you really are there investing in human potential. I, I what I love about these guys was that they, at the time that South Africans were paying anything to take money offshore, 
and put it into international companies. They had a long, hard look at a company in Australia. They could have got all the approvals from the Reserve Bank and they turned it down because it didn't meet their investment criteria. Now, if you think about what uh, um, notably Steinhoff did, they just bought anything that moved to get money out the country. Uh, whereas Afrimat has is, is retained that discipline. So I really like the company there. It's our tile. I have a personal anecdote. Uh, we've just bought some tiles recently and uh, talking to the guys at the main Nital Tile showroom, he, he, he said there was a very limited range available. Now this is strange because Nital Tile manufactures tiles in South Africa. The reason there's a limited range is because demand is exceeding anything they've ever seen before historically and I, I think it will make sense again if you consider during lockdown we all stayed at home started looking around the house oh, what needed doing up and uh, should we sell the house and upgrade well one call to an estate agent will certainly take you off that list because most uh, most houses that are being sold are being sold at a significant discount because the buyers are not getting money from banks who are gun shy. And on the other hand, the, the, you know, most of the other potential buyers would be looking to go elsewhere in the world. We know that there's a lot of immigration happening. So those of us who are staying, those of us who, who look at our homes are saying, well, let's, let's upgrade, let's make it nicer. Let's, let's, uh, let's live better in this beautiful country of ours. And so Etel Tile runs out of tiles. That's going to be good for their numbers. So I think uh, Etel Tile is, is uh, look, the share price has gone up a lot. My selection still on value is Wilson Bailey, but those are the other two who you can consider. I know Pete also touched on it yesterday in the webinar discussion, they like cash build and there's a whole bunch of other potential. Cash build's another one. Yeah. I forgot about that. Definitely. There is another one to look at. Actually, we must, uh, we must take a close look at cash build. Excellent. Um, Alec, just uh, shifting gears, Ed asks, would you ever consider eBay? I don't know it well enough. Um, I, I do know there's a company here called Bid or Buy, Bid, Bid or Buy, Bid and Buy, uh, which, uh, which I remember in the early days of MoneyWeb, uh, we, did, we flirted with them. Uh, we, were, we had a listing, so we had, uh, we had currency through, through um, uh, shares. But they were then Israeli owned or owned by people who lived in Israel or something. And they're far, far too expensive. They they had a far better understanding of of what they were worth than than we did. So there was no way we could uh, we could even get closer than going on a. You know, we couldn't even hold hands on the data, if you like. Uh, but eBay is in a similar area. I just don't know it well enough. It's one of those that uh, like Nvidia uh, that I, I haven't spent time investigating. Uh, so outside my circle of competence, I'm afraid. PG just wants to know uh, what moat does you to you have? Sorry, not you to to you. It has a moat of uh, uh, first of all tech technology. It's it's a little bit like this webinar. We've been doing this webinar for five years, and we've learned a lot. Uh, if you if you <laughs> saw us in the first few webinars. My goodness, it used to drop. We'd have all kinds of mistakes and you know, the screen would look bad. But over those five years, we've got better and better and better at it. I hope you enjoy, find it's a, it's a good experience. We use the right software now. We didn't rush off and, and, and find some other software. We invested in, in the good stuff. And you learn by using the material. To you is the biggest in the world in tertiary online education. And it's not, it's not just suddenly a, a university decides, well, let's just put all our lecturers on Zoom. It doesn't work like that. There is a heck of a lot more that goes into it with, with the interaction, with the engagement, with the tutorials, with the, the breakaway rooms. It's a whole new industry for them to learn. Like when other people came into webinars, and you've seen, I'm sure you've been on many of them, the, the sound is bad or, or they just haven't, the, the lighting is terrible. They, they just haven't gone through that learning process yet. So that's the first thing. Two years gone through the learning process. They know that's their game. That's exactly what they understand. The second big uh, moat that they have is the relationships with universities. 
if you read the previous quarterly uh, results that to you brought out, the chief executive said during the 12 weeks up to that point of COVID, this was to the end of June, they had had more inquiries from provosts who I think are like registrars of universities than inquiries and meetings with registrars of universities wanting to use to you in that 12 weeks than they had in the previous 12 years. Now that tells you two things. One, demand has just gone through the, ce the ceiling by universities realize, oh my goodness, we need to get the right partners. But two, they've been doing this stuff for 12 years. So it's not to, to you haven't just walked into the into the game. Uh, so those to me would be the two major moats. And then I take comfort from what Pratt, uh, Rob Paddock says, uh, having sold his, his company to, to you, he's, he's now long, long ago uh, worked out his, uh, his period that he had to stay invested. And he still thinks it's a great stock. Uh, and he's, he's deeply in that industry. So for me, very, very happy with it. I'm also happy with, with Slack. Uh, I think the two of those are, they're going to, to me, they're the kind of in, in, uh, investments, the kind of stocks that if the share price goes down, I want to buy more of. And that's always a very nice place to, a good reason uh, when you are investing. Thanks, Alec. Kenneth, on, uh, shifting to the east side of the uh, globe from this point, vantage point, um, he wants to know about China stocks and in particular the Ant Group IPO. Yeah, it's cheapest. I mean, what's it more than, it's the biggest IPO ever in history. And financial, yeah. Um, I think what happened uh, when the trade war broke out, the concern that I had then at that point in time was that you were getting a, a crazy guy in the White House who was doing anything to pull the plug on China. And as a consequence of that, we saw, as we've seen, uh, the the TikTok move. Uh, we've seen the threats against uh, Tencent uh, through its uh, its major um, technology. Um, so I don't know WeChat, um, which has been banned in the United States. It concerns me when you've got a very wealthy country. Remember, America has got. 5% of the world's people and 25% of the world's wealth. It's got 50% of the world's stock market, market capitalization. And if those guys, if that source of wealth is not investing or not allowed to invest in the products that you're producing, I just get a little bit concerned. Now, if Donald Trump loses the election uh, and uh, that all goes away, then I would look very closely at Ant Financial. We used to have Alibaba in the portfolio um, a little while ago. And one of the reasons why we were, were steering against Alibaba was because of what Donald Trump was up to. So I, I don't know. It's, it, you know, Warren Buffett says the, he has three piles. He says the first pile, which is very, very low uh, in, in, in that folder, is, it's got very few pieces of paper in it. He says, those are the stocks you're going to buy. The next one, which is a little bit bigger, are those are the stocks you're going to sell or you're going to avoid. And he said, the other one that goes right up to the ceiling is those that are too tough to call. And for me at this point, for, from my uh, uh, experience, the Chinese stocks are just too tough to call. But after the election, I think we need to have another look. So I know we sold IBM years ago, but Billy wants to know, with the change of CEO and splitting of the company, is it now a buy? I was reading about it the other day, and they are focusing more of their attention on uh, cloud. Uh, even back when we used to own the stock in the portfolio, they were trying to move across towards uh, more of a services area. Look, it's a, it's a phenomenal company that's got relationships with most major corporates. And it's going through a transition that perhaps the uh, Jenny Rometty, I think it is, who was the, the CEO, is going to, um, the, 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 well, certainly the CEO when, when I was following it, 
is did all the hard work, all the hard yards, and maybe the new CEO is going to be like the guys who pick up uh, resorts, property resorts out of uh, liquidation is going to get all the credit. So at $111, it's really starting to look very attractive. I think you, I think you're on the right path there. If you know that industry well, and you you can look at IBM from a, a very objective perspective and do your homework on its intrinsic value, i.e. have a look at what you anticipate that those earnings are going to be doing in the years ahead without any, just just do some numbers and you might be onto something. Just a question on Netflix and Cloudflare from Seamus and Pratesh respectively. Is it time to buy more of either or? Netflix and Cloudflare? Oof. Netflix, definitely. Um, Cloudflare, as you see, we've only got 2% in our portfolio. It was always expensive. This is a little bit like uh, one of those when you're going to buy uh, Google uh, or uh, well, back years ago when you bought Google, when it was on its run up, Capitec, when Capitec was 300 Rand, man, it looked expensive. And it went to 500 Rand, whew, it looked ridiculous. Cloudflare has got a whole world at its feet. It only does business with 16% of the Fortune 1000 companies in the United States. And you look at the products that they have and you'd say, but why isn't it doing business with 100%? But it is very rich. The rating is rich. Uh, I wouldn't go gangbusters on Cloudflare, but on Netflix, I would be very confident at these levels. Just a follow-up from Billy on the portfolio. He says, done very well from a growth perspective, and this is a growth portfolio. He says, are you considering constructing an EF, ETF dividend-type portfolio? No. Uh, I, I think what one should do is always play to your own strengths. In, in my career... Uh, I had the great fortune of going into the digital field from the most analog field in the world in, in uh, um, newspapers and television uh, in the early, early days of the internet. And that's where I focus my attention and that's what I understand. And I've also during, the, during my career had the privilege of seeing exponential companies and kind of getting my head around what happens if a company can grow 20% a year for 20 years? It's a bit like you know, China. Look at the Chinese economy, what it's done in the last quarter century or even 30, 40 years. If you can grow consistently at a, a 5 to 7 to 10% uh, economic growth rate, as they've done and some of the Asian tigers have, it's transformative when you look back in 10 or 15 years' time. And that's what this portfolio is about. It's an exponential portfolio. We try to find stocks that can grow exponentially. And I know you can point out, but what about Wilson Bailey? Well, once in a while, we'll go for a special situation. And Wilson Bailey, if the South African construction uh, sector takes off in the way that it, we think it should, um, because there's no other way really to get this country out of its quagmire, well, then Wilson Bailey will become an exponential company for a period of time. But every other shit, uh, share that's in that portfolio is growing at 20% plus, or it has the p potential to grow at 20% plus. Uh, Discovery is a little, maybe a little different, but if you look at Discovery's portfolio around the world, it certainly you know, qualifies as an exponential company as well. So that's where we are, um, not looking at ETFs and certainly not at dividend payers. Thanks, Alec. Uh, Jaman just has got a question on the Wall Street Journal. Is, she say, he or she, sorry, apologies there. Is, it's more biased, is it more biased towards the Republican right than the left? This often puts them off reading it. Uh, I think you, you I, I find uh, the Wall Street Journal to be by far the most balanced of all uh, media outlets. Um, I was looking today at Bloomberg, for instance. And its coverage on the on the election, and Bloomberg is very balanced in most cases. My goodness, it is incredibly anti-Trump, whereas uh, and it really is. It's it's hugely pro-Biden and anti-Trump, whereas the Wall Street Journal, I think because it's taking a middle line or appears to be, seems to now be pro-Trump and anti anti-Biden. What happens? What's happened with Biden with the uh, with his son's laptop, which is a bit like Gupta leaks. Is, is actually quite concerning. 
Um, but if you look deeper into American, the way American politics is structured, 30,000 lobbyists sitting in Washington. Lobbyists get paid if they influence the politicians and the media. There's 30,000 of them. Uh, surely they wouldn't get paid if they aren't having some success. So just from a South African perspective, we don't live there. We don't know how these guys operate. We don't know the systems. But the one thing I can tell you is that in our country, when there's bribery and corruption, it's pretty basic and easy to identify. Uh, not so in the United States. Um, bribery and corruption comes in very, very many different forms. And let's just leave it at that. As far as the Wall Street Journal is concerned, they have very, very deep analysis of the business field, by far the best, um, with a possible exception of the, of the Financial Times of London in the world. And we find that at Biz News, we like to stick to, to facts, we like to stick to reality, and politics is a, is a lot of hot air. <laughs> I don't think even politicians would argue that point, whereas uh, business and numbers are reality. So if you don't like the, the way that they, they think they're doing a, a middle line, if you don't like that, just ignore the political stuff because there's plenty, plenty of other, other reporting, which is um, uh, incredibly valuable. We just think it's the best, uh, the best partner that we could possibly have. And uh, it's, it makes our premium uh, offering completely, uh, well, well, huge value. Just Consider it. We can't market on this basis for obvious reasons, but if you were to buy a subscription to the Wall Street Journal sitting in the United States, it's going to cost you $26. You get Business Premium plus the Wall Street Journal complete membership for six. So from a value perspective, and if you uh, are in this webinar, you're obviously looking for value for your investment. Can't really beat it. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Mike Foster says, last month NASPAS was on the watch list as a potential sell with the Trump uh, potential ban on or WeChat. He wants to know, is it still on the watch list to sell? Uh, I, I, it's, it's, I, if you remember what I said last month, I was worried about WeChat, but NASPAS was so cheap that you, you just can't sell it. And if, and if in one day, and it's, it's that kind of uh, black swan event, if they were to unbundle WeChat, uh, WeChat uh, Tencent, for some reason, and you you sell it now, you're going to be looking like we look when we sold Tesla. So no, uh, <laughs> it's it's just it's so cheap. The, the discount of you buying this thing at 50% of the Tencent share price, if you add in the little bits and pieces that NASPAS owns outside of Tencent. It's a value player's dream. And, I, I, and in this morning's newsletter, and thanks to David Melville for sending me that graph, there's a graph going back for 15 years. And if you didn't have NASPAS in your portfolio in the South African market, in US dollar terms, you would have done nil in 15 years. Nothing, no growth whatsoever. Thank goodness for NASPAS there. And I guess it's such an important play in the South African context that and it's sitting at a 50% discount. You know, even Benjamin Graham, uh, Warren Buffett's mentor, would be saying, sorry, this is too much of a dripping roast. I can't avoid it. Thanks, Alec. I think here's an easy one to answer for you. What is the best local newspaper to follow for business news and company news? It's business news, isn't it? Well, we aren't a newspaper, but we do have Biz News Digest, which uh, which I think you'd it's a PDF, and I think you you do need to get hold of that. What um, our partners own Arena, and I think Business Day does a good job. But uh, what I would tell you from our side, we got a a, a big um, development coming in the next six weeks. So uh, I think you're going to find, call it six weeks time. Uh, at the moment, there's no question that I, that I think we cover the global markets better than anybody else, um, global equities, because that's where we've been focusing our attention. Um, we're going to be covering local equities um, a lot more aggressively, uh, and and it'll all be up in six weeks time. So watch this space. Thanks, Alec. We've come to the end, but just want to close. I know Pete touched on PPC. But Stephen just wants to know your thoughts on PPC within the construction industry. I know you touched on it yesterday. Yeah, I'll go with Pete. 
Uh, he says that uh, his concern about PPC is management. Uh, when John Gomesol was running PPC, it was always very tightly managed. Their margins were under control. They did some, they experimented with, with some strange things. I remember they brought in a, an investment analyst to run the company, uh, which is a very strange uh, decision. When, and it is, it's a real basic kind of business. And maybe as a, as a broad terms, in broad terms, when you see that somebody who's not from the industry is brought in to run a business, be cautious because there are so many little nuances, so many little little issues that that can go that that a newcomer will just not be able to pick up. But someone who's come through the ranks, who's built their life and is is is, is uh, passionate about that sector of the economy will always have an advantage on. So it shows us two things if they bring in an outsider. One, they've done really, really poor uh, succession planning within the business. And two, as a result of that, they think the guys who are there are not capable of running the company. So the guys who are there who have been told they're not capable of running the company aren't going to be sticking around. So as a consequence, you have kind of a double hit. I always find this a, a, a giveaway. When you look at the banking sector, the way that uh, the best of the banks by far, uh, First Rand and uh, Capitec, the, the, um, the way that they promote from within, there's always somebody, and Standard Bank uh, do the same thing, there's always somebody who's ready to pick up the ball from uh, if, if if at uh, if you look at just look at the the record for instance at Capitec, you had um, Gil Leroux and then uh, Stassen and then Gerry Ferry and if, when Gerry goes whenever that might be uh, hopefully in quite a long way they'll have somebody else there who spent their life at Capitec, ready to take over they know how the little bits and pieces fit together, but if Capitec were to bring in somebody from outside, they just uh, it would be a huge sell signal for me. Similarly with First Rand, who've, who've groomed their chief executives over many years, and Standard Bank, who've been doing it even longer. So just when you see a company, and I think PBC falls into that category, who bring in investment analysts, and uh, Kitzo Gordon's a great guy, but he's a politician, you know, and, and they brought him in there at PBC. He's a fantastic human being who played a massive part in the struggle. But what did he know about running a, a, a cement company? I don't know. I think the, the proof is in the pudding. And you can see this generally ac across the board when you're making investments that usually the best value creators are the people who've been in the business a long time, who aren't looking to, to promote their own egos, who actually steer away from interviews with people like me, uh, who, who generally, and just go and read Good to Great again, if you are doubting that, or uh, a book like The Outsiders um, by Thorndike, William Thorndike, excellent, excellent book, where he, he picks up on about a dozen phenomenal business success stories and talks about the chief executives, a guy there called Singleton, who you've probably never heard of. Of course, Warren Buffett's in there as well. Um, Murphy. Tom Murphy from Capital Cities, and so on. Anyway, without getting into too much detail, that's what it really is all about. It's about the detail. Every single business success story, when you talk to the chief executive and you have them in a relaxed mood and you ask them about the detail of the company, they'll be able to rattle it off to you. Um, a Donald Gordon did it. A Brian Joffe did it in a South African context. If, however, you're an outsider who comes into the company, it's very unlikely that you would have a grasp on that as, uh, as you just haven't had the experience there. Charles, thanks. I think that's a good point to end things. I know we've just run over the 1 p.m. line there, but it's all good. Um, thanks as always, Alec. And I, I, as mentioned at the start, we will publish this as soon as possible on the Business YouTube channel. I've put the link onto the chat as well there. Um, but thanks again, Ali. Thank you. And of course, this webinar will be back again, same time, well, next month for another update.
Thank you for joining us for this webinar, which is compiled and produced by the team at biznews.com. A recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. From our team, until the next time, cheerio.